Today is the day we remember the death of Jesus, the gruesome, awful things that were done to him so that we could have a seat at the table. Amen? Let's just pray before we start. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. We love you so, so much. And we just cannot thank you enough for everything that you have done for us, everything that you are continuing to do for us. And just today especially, we want to thank you for Jesus, for being so selfless and for sacrificing his life so that we now have a seat at the table. Amen. So today a lot of churches are meeting, a lot of churches are having services and, you know, I grew up at a church and we did the Stations of the Cross and it takes you through everything that happened to Jesus from the time they put the cross on him to the time they crucified him. Other churches are going to read the story, the scriptures, and I've, I've done that before. Other churches are actually going to reenact the awesome sufferings that Jesus underwent the two days leading up to his death. Some churches even reenact the crucifixion. And I was actually astounded at how many people do that. And it's quite phenomenal and quite large in the Philippines where we actually have a church. And there's a man there by the name of Reuben who for the last 33 years has reenacted a real crucifixion. He actually gets men to nail four-inch nails into his hands and feet. Now, of course, they don't take the crucifixion to the death, but what he's doing, and, and he says he does it so that people will remember what Jesus went through. He does it so that people will not forget the sacrifice that Jesus made. And I was reading that and I was really, I was moved. I was moved by this man. And this year is his 33rd year. And he said, Jesus left this earth when he was 33. And he says, I'm going to stop doing it now. He says, and now someone else can take over what I've done for 33 years. But this man was so moved by what Jesus did for him that he wanted to undertake the same sufferings every year, which I thought was very honourable. And you know, Jesus, the night before he was arrested, he got together with his disciples, with his inner circle, and he had what we know as the Last Supper. And he took the elements on the table, the bread and the wine, and he did a communion with them, which we're going to do in a little while. That's why the cups are already on your seat. But he told them to do it in remembrance of him. And this guy, Reuben, in the Philippines is taking that to the next level. He really is. He's actually taking on the suffering of Jesus so that people will not forget what happened to Jesus so that we could now have a life with God. But this morning, I want to do something just a little bit different. And I want to go back to the very beginning. I want to have a look at Jesus's life as a baby and Jesus's life as a boy. Just um, for the last couple of months, I've been really thinking about the life of Jesus. And I think from the very beginning, Jesus suffered a life of adversity. It wasn't an easy life that he lived. And I think to remember all of his life this morning will honour him and it'll teach us and it'll encourage us. It'll actually teach us resilience because of what he had to endure from the time he was born till he got to 33 years of age. And I think that it'll help us understand that no matter what our circumstances in our life look like, God is with us 24-7 because God was with Jesus 24-7, even on the cross. He was there. But Jesus underwent what it was that he had to undergo for the sake of us. And this morning, I just want to look back because I do believe that Jesus' struggle started from the moment of conception. We know the story, and if you don't, his parents, Jesus was conceived out of wedlock. They had not married yet. So here's Mary, and I told this story last year. She gets this visit from an angel, and he tells her that she is with child. She's actually carrying the Son of God Joseph finds out about it and he's thinking, how am I going to get out of this? I no longer want to marry this woman. She's obviously done 
something that she wasn't supposed to do and then he has this amazing visitation and it really is a beautiful event and Joseph does stay with Mary and they do go on to have Jesus. And what's amazing about this is, and it is beautiful and it is spectacular, but it happened in a human world. It didn't happen in heaven. Now, just think about this. It happened in a human world. So Jesus had to grow up with the stigma of being conceived out of wedlock. Now, gossip is not a new thing. Gossip was around way back then. So people would have been talking about Joseph and Mary and then they would have been talking about Jesus from the moment that he was born. So he had to grow up with this stigma from birth that he was conceived out of wedlock. Some commentaries that you read even say that when he was born, Joseph and Mary were not yet married. So he was born out, conceived and born out of wedlock, which brings us to his birth. And again, a spectacular event was the birth of Jesus. You know, and we know the story. There were shepherds in a field and they had this amazing visitation by the angel of the Lord. And he says to them, the Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And the wise men are astounded by this visitation and they, they go and they visit Jesus. And then we also know about the wise men. They too are visited and they're astounded by this visitation and they declare the newborn king of the Jews is coming to us and they too go and visit Jesus and here's Mary and Joseph they're in a stable they've had this child and these shepherds have come and the wise men have come and it, it's it's spectacular it is it really really is spectacular but what we don't read a lot and what we don't remember a lot is that there was a king again this is happening in a human world and there is a king by the name of Herod and he's threatened by this. He's threatened. His kingdom and his kingship is now being threatened by the king of the Jews. And he puts out an order that boys from the age of birth to two be killed. So Jesus is now responsible for the death of many young boys. He is now responsible for the heartache of men and women who have lost their son and he now not only is growing up with the stigma of being conceived and born out of wedlock he is now growing up with the burden and the responsibility of being responsible for the death of these little boys and you know already this this burden on his shoulders is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger but he's doing it He's doing it again. We remember these, these stories not to be downcast, but to be encouraged that regardless of what was happening in Jesus' world, he was still taking the journey that God had orchestrated for him. Which brings me to his, his life as a young boy. And it really was a spectacular life. It really was. Jesus, we're not privy to what happened while, when Jesus was a boy. We get a glimpse here and there but I, I honestly believe that he would have been a remarkable young man. And um, the Bible records that the things that happened to Jesus from the beginning, Mary, she stored them in her heart and she treasured them and she kept them. But then again, he's in a human world and he's got siblings. Who's got siblings? I had them and boy, was sibling rivalry real. Imagine growing up in a home with Jesus. Think about it. Mary would have favoured him. Come on, let's get real. When I think of Jesus, I think of Joseph. And he was favoured. And he was so favoured that his dad made him this amazing coat and his brothers could not stand him. And what did they do? They sold him into slavery. Now, Jesus' brothers and sisters weren't that bad. They didn't quite do that. But we do get a glimpse of it in John chapter 7 and we see that they're having difficulty with him. They're having difficulty with his life. They're having difficulty with his words. 
And, you know, some say that they orchestrated to kill him, whatever it was. I don't believe that. I think they were just struggling with his lifestyle. And what I get out of that is Jesus, again, thinking, wow, not even my brothers and sisters support me. But again, he keeps pushing on, he keeps pushing through, and he keeps going the journey. And I was thinking about um, Jesus when he did his first miracle at the wedding and he changed the wine into water. Now, just think about this for a moment. Why did Mary go and ask him to do that? I say that's not his first miracle. I think his brothers and sisters struggled because I think Jesus was doing miracles in his home. And Mary would have been like, hey, Jesus, there's not enough food. Can you do your thing? And there was more food on the table. I don't know. Jesus, your brother's not well. Can you heal him? Sure, mum. This is the kind of life that the siblings were growing up with. And they were struggling with him. They were not supporting him. But still, he pushed through. And as a young boy, another struggle that I think of when I think of Jesus is he had to sit in the synagogue. Now, just think about this for a moment. Our saviour had to sit in the synagogue and he had to hold his tongue because he could not reveal who he was because his time had not yet come. He had to listen to the religious leaders teaching about God and getting it all wrong, really. The Pharisees, the leaders of the church at the time, as far as Jesus was concerned, they were getting it all wrong, but it was not yet his time And he really couldn't do anything about it while he was still a boy. So he had to go to the synagogue and listen, but hold his tongue. Bible records that every year after he was born, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. And if you were here Wednesday night, John spoke a little bit about that. At the time of the Passover, the greatest rabbis of the land would assemble to teach and to discuss great truths about Jesus. The coming Messiah would have been a big topic. They would have been sitting there talking about Jesus while he was in their midst. It it blows my mind. And, you know, the Bible says that he was eager to listen and he asked probing questions. He just did the the minimum, minimum of what he could do without revealing who he was. And, a, and a, the Bible says that many who heard him speak in the synagogue were amazed at his understanding, but they never recognised him. So here he is as a young boy exercising such restraint. So as a baby, he had the gossips all out talking about him. And then he had this horrible burden of all these boys that died because of him. And now he's sitting in the synagogue and you can imagine he can't say anything. In chapter 2 of Luke, we see Jesus as a boy for the last time. This is the last time we see him. He's 12 years of age. He's almost an adult. He goes to the synagogue with his parents and some of you know the story. And he doesn't leave. He stays there and his parents travel back and three days later they find him. And they find him in his father's house. Now, I've grown my children up. But I tell you what, if I had have lost them at 12 years of age for three days, my daughter's not here. I lost her son the other day in Target for three minutes. And I was freaking out. Don't tell her. Her name's Jessie. Don't tell her. His parents lost him for three days. Think about it. And then when they find him, he's just sitting there chatting with the Pharisees and the leaders. And he's like, what's wrong? I'm in my father's house. It's all cool. A little glimpse, a little bit of restraint he lost there. And he said, it's all good. It's all good. Imagine he would have been bursting. He would have wanted to jump out of his skin. He is almost an adult, but he's exercising restraint. And he's saying, okay, mum and dad, I'll come home with you. And off he goes, and we really don't hear anything about Jesus until he comes and starts his ministry. If I can have the girls just come and join me, just play some background music. 
He had to grow up in the temple, listening to the religious leaders teaching about him, the promised Messiah. Wow. He sat there listening to the torture that was to be his. And this is really where I'm taking this message this morning. He had to sit and listen to the road that was set before him. He came to this earth knowing he would be despised, rejected by most. He came to this earth knowing that they would reject the promised Messiah. He was in their midst and they did not recognize him. Do you think if Jesus walked into this church this morning, we would recognize him? I say we would. I say with, within our spirits that something would be burning and we would be like, wow, that's Jesus. But because they were not focused on the Messiah, just purely position and whatever, stature, whatever, we're not going to go there this morning, they missed, they missed it. He grew up listening to scripture being recited, knowing it was about him. But not speaking a word. <clears throat> Before we take communion, I usually do read the account of the Garden of Gethsemane. But this morning, I want to read something else. I want to read a passage of scripture that Jesus grew up listening to all his life. And he still came. And that's Isaiah 53. Verse 2 says, There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. Those two voices, those two verses are massive. Our weakness he carried, our sorrows. He was pierced for our rebellion crushed for our sin. He was beaten and it was a terrible, horrible beating to within a, a, an inch of his life. He was beaten so we could be whole. Wow. Verse 6. <clears throat> All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have taken God's paths to follow our own. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. Again, we see the restraint of Jesus, the discipline. Verse 8, unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream. He was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong. He had never deceived anyone. He was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. Let's just stop for a moment and get this right. This was God's good plan. The devil was not winning here. This was God's good plan. The crucifixion of Jesus is not the end of the story. And I think I say that every Good Friday when I'm asked to speak. It's not the end of the story. Jesus is not a helpless victim of the circumstances. No way. No one can make me think that. This was the fulfillment of God's purpose, the plan that he wrote. 
the Lord's good plan. Let's be encouraged. Let's be encouraged by Jesus, but also let's be encouraged that God is the author and finisher. He is the one who wrote this plan, and Jesus was the obedient servant that went and fulfilled it. It's just a beautiful story. Verse 11 says, When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous. This is us, for he will bear all their sins. Jesus did what he did for us. Jesus did what he did so we could have a life. All of this was prophesied. He heard this while he was young, just a boy. He knew what was going to happen at precisely the time it was going to happen, and yet he still came. I titled that my message this morning because he knew and he still came. What I'd like to point out here is that Jesus was fully human. And you've heard me talk a lot about this. Jesus was fully human. And being fully human, he had what we have, free will. He had a free will. In the Garden of Gethsemane, the battle was real. He told his disciples that his soul had been plunged into deep sorrow and agony. Luke's gospel records that when he was praying with the Father, his agony was so intense that his sweat became great drops of blood. That is massive. What he was going through was real. Yes, he was the Son of God, but he was in a human body. So he was feeling all the anguish and all the pain and he was sweating great drops of blood and in Matthew 26 39 he asks the father father if it is possible let this cup of suffering be taken away from me full stop mid verse and I've, I've often thought about this verse and I've thought about it and thought about it and after writing this sermon I just imagine that in between this brief pause, what Jesus was thinking, the human emotions that were attacking him. Imagine what he was thinking. He's in a human body. He had every right to say no. He really did. No, I'm not going to do this. These people don't deserve it. This is me. This is what I'd be saying. They were awful to me. My own siblings were awful to me. The religious leaders got it all wrong. They've got no idea what my father wanted his house, his church to look like. I'm not going to do this. These people are not worth dying for. End full stop. What does the rest of that verse say? Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. He had every right to say no. He was ridiculed, mocked, gossiped about, but he still came. He still came knowing what was going to happen to him, unjustly arrested, lied about, beaten to within an inch of his life, and he went through with it even though he didn't have to. This morning, (coughs) excuse me, We celebrate that he chose us. We celebrate that he chose to die so we could live. That's what we're celebrating this morning. We stand here today because of Jesus. Those songs that you girls chose this morning, beautiful, just told the story. We stand here today able to take communion in remembrance of what Jesus did because even And although he was fully human with free will, he said, yet your will be done, not mine. This morning, can we all stand in honour of Jesus, in honour of what has been done for us? Jesus instructed us to take communion in remembrance of him. Just take the cup, I'll, I'll lead you soon. Today, Good Friday, we remember the most selfless act that ever took place place this morning we are remembering the most selfless life 
from the very beginning that was ever lived. When Jesus breathed his last breath, the Bible records that the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and it was a massive veil. It was a thick veil. It was through the power of God that that veil was torn. We now have a seat at the table. Jesus is already here, and we now have a seat at the table because of what Jesus did for us. And that is worth talking about. That is worth honouring. That is worth remembering. That is worth reciting, not just Good Friday, every day. I hope you guys take communion every day or think about that every day. And that, temp, that, that veil was torn. And that now allows us to walk into the presence of God boldly, just like the priests did. And that's amazing. But even better, because God doesn't give you the same as the priest. He gives us better. We not only can walk into the presence of God boldly, but we get to stay here. They had to walk in and walk out, but we get to stay here every day, every day. And not only that, I'm crying. they did it with fear and trembling. The priests would go into the presence of God with bells on their garments because had they not done the sacrifice right or had they not lived right that week, they died. And there was a rope attached to their ankle and they would be dragged, the, the bells would go off and the people would know that the priest had done something wrong and he died and they would have to, because they couldn't go into the presence of God because they would have died. So the rope was so that they could pull him out from the presence of God so they wouldn't die. So not only do we get to now live and sit with Jesus, we get to do it without fear and trembling. We get to do it in honour and in love and in appreciation. That's massive. That's what we celebrate today. So this morning, we're going to take communion together in honour of that. In honour that we get to do it in love and appreciation. So you've got a cup on your seat. Just You rip the top layer off and there's a little, commun a little bit of bread and underneath is the juice. And just, just take a moment. The girls are going to just sing in the background. There's no rush this morning. Just take a moment. The was finished at Calvary. Your body broken you, so mine is complete. Thank you, Jesus. My testimony. Thank you for breaking your body so that I could be whole. Christ, there's a miracle in me. Thank you for shedding your blood the work was so that I could be set free, made holy, broken, so able to enter complete. into the presence of God and stay there. My testimony Not in fear and trembling, but in love, honour and appreciation. Because of Christ, there's a miracle Because of me. Jesus, this is all possible. The work was and yes, we remember it today on Good Calvary. Friday, but may we never let a day go by where we do not think about this, where we do not thank Father God for this. morning I want to pray for our congregation Lord I want to pray that we live from this this is where we propel from what you did for us Jesus the seat at the table that you gave us that we will make this our cornerstone that we will make this our foundation that this is where we outwork from that we will never judge somebody. We will never qualify somebody for our time or our forgiveness. You never qualified us. We never had to go through any stringent rules and regulations. You gave us this freely. Jesus, you came as a boy, a child, a baby, knowing what was going to happen. You came freely because you loved God and you loved us. So this morning, we stand in honour, Jesus, of you. 
and collectively we just want to say thank you Jesus say that out aloud raise your hands just say thank you Jesus thank you for coming Father God, thank you for being so selfless and sacrificing your son so that we could sit at the table. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thank you. Like it's already been said, please don't run off. Stay, stick around, have a coffee, enjoy hot cross buns. They've all come. Hot cross buns, I don't know if you know this, but they represent, that's a cross. They represent Easter and Jesus and his death on the cross. That's why we eat them on Good Friday. Have a coffee, but please, guys, come back on Sunday. Like I said, this is not the end of the story. Sunday, we're going to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen? Thank you.